Okay, so we know the only thing that affects the speed of a wave is the medium, but what about the medium uh, affects uh, the speed? What, what makes a medium fast or slow? What makes, uh, what makes the speed of sound different in different medium media? Uh, what makes a, a spring fast or slow in transmitting a wave? So that's what we want to kind of get into today. Uh, so we can think of if we if we go back to like kind of a slinky analogy. So doing a, a wave down a slinky, uh, we can think of each little bit of that slinky as being a little simple harmonic oscillator. So this is the wave that's being sent down the slinky, and this is the little bit of that slinky that's oscillating back and forth, or one of the little bits uh, that's oscillating back and forth. Uh, and the faster that this thing can cycle back and forth, the greater the frequency or the smaller the period of this oscillator, the faster this wave can transmit down from one end to the other. Okay, uh, so uh, so the frequency is the, the greater the frequency, the uh, the um, um, the faster that wave is going to transmit. So frequency is equal to one over two pi root uh, k over m. So we've got a spring constant, uh, which is the restoring force, and we've got a mass and the inertia uh, section. So the bigger the springiness factor, the faster the wave is going to transmit, and the, uh, the, the, um, the bigger this inertia factor, uh, the slower the wave is going to transmit. So, um, so a, a stronger spring with low mass is going to have a faster vibration, which is going to, uh, which is going to um, uh, mean a, a fast uh, wave traveling down that spring. So again, keep in mind we've got the restoring force, which is increasing the velocity, and we've got the, the inertia factor, which is decreasing it. So jot this equation down here. Uh, the velocity of a, of a transverse wave um, is equal to the square root of the force of tension in that, in that uh, media uh, divided by excuse me, the mass per unit length. Okay, so m is the mass of the of the spring, and l is the uh, the length of the of the spring or rope or whatever it is you're talking about. Uh, or you can think of this as just the mass per per meter of that rope, the kilograms per meter of that rope. Okay, so velocity equals the square root of f of t over m over l. Okay, so the greater the velocity, uh, the greater the tension in that that rope, the greater the velocity. And the, the, the lighter that spring is, uh, the greater the velocity. So how does stretching a spring, how does it affect um, these things? How will it stretching the spring affect the force of tension? Well, it's going to increase, okay? Uh, because the spring is going to pull back harder the further you stretch it. What about the mass per unit length? How is that, is that going to be affected by stretching the spring? Sure it is. That same amount of mass is going to get stretched out uh, into a longer uh, length, so the mass per unit length is going to decrease. So stretching a spring increases the velocity for two reasons. It increases the tension and it decreases the mass per unit length. Okay, uh, This is normally when I demonstrate the velocity down a couple different springs, but let's work a math problem instead. So Slinky has got a mass of 0.866 kilograms and is stretched between two people 3.5 meters apart. When two people pull on it with a force of 55 newtons, they shake on it with a frequency of 6 hertz. What is the velocity of the uh, pulse traveled down the spring, and what is the wavelength? Okay, so let's let's take a look at that. So the uh, the tension they said was 55 newtons. Uh, the mass of the spring was 0.866, and it was that that mass was three and a half meters when stretched. So when we uh, solve this with the square root, we get that the velocity should be 14.9 meters per second down that slinky. Okay. The next step of the problem was, well, what's going to be the wavelength? Well, we used the equation we got yesterday, where v equals lambda f, where v equals the, uh, the, the, wave, the velocity, which we just calculated. Uh, lambda is what we're trying to find, and the frequency was given as 6. So we got... Uh, uh, the uh, the wavelength is going to equal 2.48 meters. And what was C? Uh, if it was connected to a spring with four times the mass per unit length, what would the new wavelength be? Okay, well, 
if the velocity goes, uh, the mass uh, increases by four, then that means that the uh, the uh, the velocity is going to change by the, the square root of four, which should be two. I don't know why this says four. Um, this should be the root of two. So it should be that the uh, the wavelength would be one point two four. So sorry about the mistake there. Okay, all right, two basic types of waves. Uh, we've got transverse waves, which have been the waves that we've really been talking about, uh, where if you shake a slinky up and down, that's the wave that you get. And notice that the wave pulse is traveling, let's say, to the right. The wave pulse is traveling to the right. The medium is oscillating up and down. So if you just look at this one dot here, uh, it's just traveling up and down. So the, the, the medium oscillates perpendicular to the wave velocity. Okay, if we look at what's called a uh, longitudinal wave, sometimes called a compression wave, um, then if we, we were, first off we notice we see these compressions, which we don't see uh, in the transverse wave. Um, uh, but notice that the, the wave crests are traveling to the right, okay, and the medium is traveling, is oscillating to the right and to the left. So uh, the medium oscillates parallel to the wave velocity in a longitudinal wave. Okay, and what type of wave are we seeing down here? Yeah, that would be a longitudinal wave. Okay, so again, kind of reiterating that uh, here we've got a transverse wave. The medium is oscillating up and down. Uh, the wave is traveling to the right, so they're perpendicular, uh, perpendicular to each other. Uh, here in a longitudinal wave, the wave is traveling to the right. Again, we notice we get these compressions, um, and uh, the uh, the wave is, is oscillating to the left and to the right. And this makes sense because which way would you have to shake the medium to, to create these waves? So if I want to create this wave, I've got to shake the medium up and down, and that's the way the medium is oscillating, is up and down. If I wanted to create a wave like this, I'd have to oscillate, I'd have to push this end in and out to create these compressions. And that's the way the medium is oscillating, is in and out, left and right. Okay? So, uh, and, and here's another example of a, uh, of a wave. Uh, what type of wave do we have here? Okay. Uh, the medium is oscillating to the right and to the left. Uh, we're, we're seeing compression, so that is a longitudinal wave. Okay, here's a, just another uh, image of a, of a longitudinal wave. Uh, this represents uh, air molecules in a sound wave. Um, so sound travels as a uh, compression wave or a longitudinal wave. Uh, and these little, these compressions are, and what are, these are called rarefactions, where it's rarefied in the middle. Um, these that's what transmit the waves. And if you look at this, it almost looks 3D. If you can, if you can see, this is like a low point, and this is like as a high point. Um, that looks pretty cool. But again, notice the medium is traveling to the left and to the right, uh, much slowed down in this example. Um, another example, okay, and a, a yet yet one more example. Um, so now. What type of a wave do you create at a uh, at a stadium uh, when you do the wave? Uh, which way is, does the medium move? Well, what is the medium? You're the medium. The people are the medium. Uh, you jump up and down, so you you do the wave up and down, and the wave travels to from left to right. So that is a transverse wave that's being created. Uh, if you wanted to create the uh, longitudinal wave at the stadium, you would have to uh, kind of oscillate. Uh, left and right, uh, although I, I suspect that your uh, your compatriots would not know what it is you're doing. Uh, so I don't really recommend trying that at, at a stadium, uh, but you're more than welcome to. Okay, um, now both of these waves share a lot of similarities. They both have wavelength, okay? So here the wavelength is from compression to compression, okay? Or from rarefaction to rarefaction. Okay, from crest to crest, uh, a compression is like a crest, a high pressure point. Uh, okay, they both have frequency. If they've got, if they've, they've got, uh, they both have velocity. Uh, earthquakes travel as both types. Um, so, 
uh, and I had a website that, that used to show that, but it's no longer available, so I'm not going to show that. Whoops. Oh, well. Uh, so here we've got a, a long wavelength uh, compression wave, longitudinal wave. Uh, and here we've got a shorter wavelength, longitudinal wave. Uh, but they both have the same velocity. Uh, so this would be like a high frequency sound and a low frequency sound. Um, so, um, and compression waves or longitudinal waves also have uh, different amplitudes. Um, the amplitude has to do with how compressed the compressions are um, and how rarefied the rarefactions are. So here we've got a lower amplitude. Uh, the compressions aren't really that compressed, etc. Uh, and here we have a higher amplitude uh, where the compressions are more compressed. So a lot of similarities between uh, all waves. Okay. Um, so we can we can model uh, matter as as atoms being connected by springs, and, and that model holds uh, is useful for a lot of different different regions. So here, what we're showing is this is some solid, and here we've got a, a compression wave that's traveling through um, this this solid. Uh, and these, these springs represent the, the molecular bonds or the atomic bonds uh, and that kind of thing. So uh, the stronger the springs, the higher the spring constant, uh, the faster that wave can, can propagate uh, and the lighter the atoms, uh, so moving up on the top left of the periodic table, uh, the faster that that wave can travel uh, through that material. Um, and you do not need to write this equation down, but there's a, there's a similar equation uh, for for uh, uh, if we're looking at waves traveling through uh, like water or or, or air uh, instead of just like a slinky with a spring constant and tension force and all that, uh, it follows the same basic idea. There's a uh, there's a strength of the spring factor, a spring constant factor, and then there's an inertia factor. Uh, the spring constant factor for for a, a bulk material like air or water or steel. Uh, is known as the bulk modulus, uh, and it has to do with uh, it, how much it resists changing, uh, shrinking when under when, when compressed. Um, so, uh, and then the inertia factor is the density. Uh, so these are some uh, bulk moduli for for different materials. Uh, steel has a pretty high bulk modulus, uh, whereas water. Uh, and uh, has a lower bulk modulus in air. Uh, gases have even lower bulk moduli. Um, so, uh, now what's going to happen to the density of something as it's heated? So, well, if we heat something, it's going to expand. Its mass isn't going to change. So, its density is going to go down. Uh, what should that do to the velocity of the wave through that material? Well, if we decrease the density, that means this is going to get bigger, and uh, so the velocity is going to get bigger. So let's play uh, what effects, uh, what's going to happen to the speed of sound as we, as we talk about different materials. So the speed of sound through air at zero degrees C is right around 330 meters per second. Is the speed of sound in helium going to be faster or slower? Faster or slower? Well, we won't say the same because none of them are the same. Okay, well, in helium, helium is a lighter molecule, or a lighter atom, sorry. Uh, it's going to be uh, faster, quite a bit faster. Uh, which is uh, related to why your voice goes up uh, when you inhale helium. Okay. Now compared to air at zero degrees C, what about air at 20 degrees C? So compared to 330, what should happen to the speed of sound through air as it gets warmer? No, we just said it should increase, and it does go up. You know, not not a ton, but a significant amount. Okay. What about compared to the speed of sound through air, 330? What about the speed of sound through water? Is that going to be uh, more or less or the same? Well, you might uh, be tempted to say, well, the density is bigger, so that's going to make the speed go slower. But the bulk modulus is also a lot bigger. Um, so it ends up that sound travels faster through uh, through through water uh, in a lot of ways because the, the molecules are, are fat are closer together than, than air molecules, so they're able to transmit that uh, sound much more quickly. Okay. What about in aluminum? Uh, compared to, to water, what about the speed of sound in aluminum? And, well, 
the atoms are even more tightly bound together. Uh, so the speed of sound is is uh, is quite a bit uh, greater in aluminum than water, and quite a bit greater than than uh, than air. Uh, what about diamond? Okay, the speed of sound in diamond. Well, a diamond you can think of as basically one big molecule of carbon. Um, so those atoms are bonded together very very tightly. So the speed of sound through a diamond is is even greater, twelve thousand meters per second. Okay, what about the speed of sound through a vacuum? Okay, where there's no air. Okay, well there's there's no air, there's no sound, uh, so there's no no sound. Uh, so mechanical waves need a medium uh, such as uh, slinky uh, air, water, rope, etc. Uh, electromagnetic waves do not need a medium. Uh, that's how the light can travel from the uh, the sun to the earth. Uh, through the vacuum of space. Uh, it's because it does not need a medium. Okay, uh, almost almost done here. Bear with me for a few more minutes here. So, uh, what happens when two waves meet? So let's say I've got two waves. Okay, do they do they bounce off of each other or do they go through each other? Well, what do these pictures seem to indicate? Okay, they go through each other. Um, and what my primary interest uh, next is what happens when they're right at the same location. Uh, well, we get we get one of two types of interference. One is called constructive interference, and this is constructive interference when you have an up hump and another up hump, and they 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 merge onto the same location at the same time, uh, and they they constructively grow, uh, and then the waves travel through each other. But while they're on top of each other. Uh, this is known as constructive interference. Okay, so constructive interference you can think of as in phase, uh, if you've used that term in math uh, before. So as long as your ups line up with the other ups and the downs line up with the other downs, um, you get a bigger wave that results. Uh, they add. Okay, so a plus b. Uh, so again, that's constructive interference. Uh, the other type of interference we have is destructive interference, and that's when an up and a down line up. Uh, they're on the same rope at the same time, or the same air pocket of air at the same time. Um, and and when an e equal size uh, up uh, meets an equal size down, um, then the rope goes flat at that moment. Um, so and then the waves just pop out. They, uh, they continue on as if nothing had uh, ever happened. Um, so they go through each other. They don't, they don't disappear uh, permanently. Um, okay, so this is destructive interference when an up and a down line up, um, or a down and an up line up, uh, they cancel each other out if they're the same size. Okay. Uh, so here I've got uh, an applet that's, that does a pretty good job of, of showing this. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to send two equal pulses towards each other, and uh, and we'll we'll see uh, what kind of interference is that. Okay, that is constructive interference because uh, we've got an up and an up. Okay, um, so let's. Let's change one to uh, an up and a down, okay? And then uh, we should see destructive interference. Okay, now notice that it did, the rope doesn't stay flat for that long, okay? It's only flat for a split second. Uh, and I can slow this down a little bit. Okay, uh, now notice it does not stay flat. And notice how the waves, why they're able to pop through each other. It's because they never stop moving. Even though they're flat, those waves are still moving. Um, and uh, that's why they're able to pop back out. So now if I, uh, let me slow this down a little bit. Uh, now if I have one that's uh, not quite as tall as the other one, here, let's make the up one. Uh, Okay, so then I'm going to end up with some left over. It doesn't have to be complete cancellation. Um, so there'll be some uh, down re residual, uh, and then the waves pop out like normal. Uh, 
So you can see the website if you're interested in, in uh, playing around with this. ophysics.com uh, forward slash w2html. It's a pretty short short web website. Um, so that is that. Uh, I think that's about it. Uh, oh, there's a couple different things. So uh, now air molecules can do this too. Uh, if I have a, uh, a constructive interference with air molecules, remember what I get is a taller wave or an increase in amplitude. Okay, so if I send sound uh, or, or some kind of uh, uh, longitudinal wave um, and, and they line up, what I get is an increased amplitude or an increase in density of my, uh, of my compressions and a, and a decrease in density of my rarefactions. Um, so, and what we would get is loud sound, okay? Uh, if I were to spend a, a wave, and I'll, I'll do this for those of you that are in class, uh, we'll get out a couple speakers and we'll, we'll do some sound demos. Um, but if I send a, a, a crest and a trough at the same location, um, that's kind of like these two pictures going together. Um, we end up with, with no compression seen. Um, and uh, that would be like no sound is being tra uh, transmitted. So um, they, they're out of phase. The, the waves cancel each other out. Okay. Uh, here's a picture of constructive and destructive interference with, with waves. Uh, you can see that this looks to be a crest. And then the, there's a crest from this other wave that lines up and they, they add up a little bit. Uh, so they add up and then where, the, where there's a trough, uh, they, they subtract out a little bit, but you can still see the, this, this wave, this round, big round one, um, which is, uh, has a greater amplitude, so it's winning out. Okay. Um, now if I, if I set these two waves, let's say I had two different wave sources. So we, you can see these two center circles. What I've got is two, um, sets of concentric circles representing two waves being sent out from two different devices. Um, right here, uh, where the waves are overlapping, we would have constructive interference, okay? And then over here, where they're, they're, they're out of phase, um, that I would have destructive interference. Now, as I move these things apart, uh, the, the interference patterns change. Um, and so here you see I've got constructive interference, destructive interference. I separated these a little bit. Uh, constructive, destructive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, um, okay, and that is it for today. Sorry that was a little bit longer, but uh, thanks for bearing with me. And um, um, so you can do up to uh, 20 under waves in simple harmonic motion. Uh, you can go ahead and, and uh, skip over 17. Um, we don't have to do that one. Uh, so anyway, uh, good luck on the problems and come see me at uh, office hours slash uh, virtual time if you need help.